Electrical Stimulation Techniques. The content in this lecture can be located in Chapter 12 in the Therapeutic Modalities text by Chad Starkey and in Chapter 10 in the Therapeutic Modalities, The Art and Science text by Kenneth Knight and David Draper. We're going to start with a pop quiz. Name the type of electrical signal as represented by the examples on the slide. Ready? Go! So how'd you do? A is a continuous biphasic alternating current. This is an example of a sinusoidal wave, which is very common in modalities. B is a continuous monophasic direct current. The current in this graph only stays on the positive side of the isoelectric line. C is a burst biphasic alternating current. There is an interpulse interval in this example. D is a continuous biphasic alternating current. This is an example of a box wave. This is exactly the same as example A. The only difference is the shape of the wave. E is a pulse direct current. F is a pulsed burst direct current. This current has an interpulse interval between the bursts as well as an intrapulse interval, which is the off time in between each pulse. G is a continuous biphasic alternating current. This is an example of a triangle wave. This is the exact same example as seen in A and D. The only difference again is the shape of the wave. H is a continuous monophasic direct current. The current is the same as in example B. I is a pulse direct current. This is the same type of current seen in E, just a different shape. In these examples, there weren't any ramping currents. All of the currents were balanced phases and were also symmetrical. So how did you do? Hopefully better than you thought. So just as a review of the practical example of the human body and its interaction with electrical stimulation, remember that the human body is essentially a mass of tissues and fluids. The better the water content of the tissue or the more water content, the better the conductor for electricity. As the electrical impulses enter the body, it must first pass through the skin, which may provide a significant resistance to the electrical current, and therefore is a poor conductor for electricity. Bone, tendons, fascia, and adipose are all other poor conductors of electrical stimulation. After passing through the skin, the electrical pulse enters the fat, in which has very little resistance due to high water content. Muscles, nerve, Bone and fat are all good conductors for electrical impulses due to high water content. Tissues within the human body are either classified as excitable or non-excitable. Excitable tissues are directly influenced by the current and have the ability to respond to the current, usually through contraction, an action potential, or an increased cell membrane permeability. Examples of tissues that are excitable are nerves, muscle, and cell membranes. Non-excitable tissues do not directly respond to current, but may be influenced by the electrical fields caused by the current. Examples of tissues that are non-excitable are bone, cartilage, tendons, and adipose tissue. In order to have an effect, we must be able to excite excitable tissues with the use of electrical energy. Nerve fibers have a capacitance, which is the ability to store an electrical charge. If the current is more than the nerves can store, an action potential results very quickly. Large diameter nerves have a low capacitance or ability to store an electrical charge. Examples of large diameter nerves are the A alpha and A beta nerves, which respond to touch and pressure, as well as the muscle spindle and Golgi tendon organ within the muscle. Small diameter nerves and muscles have a high capacitance or the ability to store an electrical charge. Examples of small diameter nerves are the A delta and the C fibers, which respond to pain signals. With the ability to excite excitable tissues, there is what's called a strength duration curve. 
There is an association between the intensity of the current and the phase duration of the current, which will evoke different nerve impulses. A short phase duration will require a higher intensity. A longer phase duration requires lower intensity to stimulate the same nerve. This graph can be located on page 248, figure 12.11 within the Starkey text. Because of the capacitative resistance formed by the cell membranes, short pulses or pulse durations are more selective in the nerve fiber stimulated than are pulses having longer durations. We can see this with the A beta, the motor, A delta, and C fibers. Shorter duration currents require an increased amount of current to stimulate the same type of nerve fiber than do currents that have a longer duration. The use of electrical stimulation for the therapeutic purposes goes back a long time. This is not a new treatment within the therapeutic world. There are several physiological effects associated with the application of electrical stimulation. At a cellular level, the application of electrical stimulation will result in an excitation of nerve cells, changes in cell permeability, usually an increase in the cellular permeability, increases in protein synthesis, stimulation of fibroblasts and osteoblasts, and modification of microcirculation. At a tissue level, the application of electrical stimulation results in frequent muscle contractions, tissue regeneration, and an increased tissue remodeling. At a segment level, the application of electrical stimulation results in a muscle pumping action, lymphatic drainage, and a blood flow improvement. By segment, we are usually talking about a body part, such as an arm, a leg. At a systemic level, the application of electrical stimulation results in analgesic effects and improvements of overall circulation. These physiological effects can occur through two mechanisms, either through direct effects or indirect effects. The direct effects occurs along the line of the current flow. The indirect effect occurs as a result of the physiological response in an area remote to the site of the current flow. Electrodes are devices that are attached to the terminals of a generator or an electrical stimulator unit through which current enters and leaves the body. Electrodes come in a variety of sizes, shapes, and materials and are named accordingly to their function. There are many types of electrodes, including polymers, metal, carbon impregnated silicone rubber, self-adhesive, and many more. Electrodes introduce current to the body. They function as a medium needed to decrease the resistance. The electrodes are attached to the body through a lead, which is the pathway from the modulator to the human body. There is a table 12-2 on page 242 in the Starkey text that is recommended for students to examine. This table includes the methods of reducing skin to electrode resistance. The three most popular electrode systems over the years have been the following. Number one, metal sponge electrodes. These are a thin metal plate that attaches to the wire from the terminal. A wet sponge is placed between the metal plate and the skin to increase the conductivity between the two. These are held in place with a flexible rubber belt or a sandbag. The second type of electrode is a carbon or silicone impregnated rubber electrode with a sponge, paper towel, or conductive gel interface. Carbon or silicone is added to the rubber, which is an insulator so that it becomes a conductor. A wet sponge, a wet paper towel, or a conductive gel is placed between the rubber plate and the skin to increase the conductivity between the two. These are held in place with a flexible rubber band or a sandbag, just like the electrodes in example one. The third type of electrodes are adhesive back carbon or silicone impregnated rubber electrodes. Adhesive is used in place of the sponge or paper towel and the rubber belt or sandbag. These are quicker and easier to apply, but are more expensive than the other systems. They were intended to be single-use, disposable electrodes, but most people reuse them 8 to 10 times, or sometimes even more, until the adhesive loses its stickiness. The one issue with reusable electrodes that we have to consider is the potential to have cross-contamination. Self-adhesive electrodes should only be reused on the same patient. If used on different patients, bacteria from one patient may be transferred to the next patient. 
The shape of an electrode is not important. Most of them are round, square, or rectangular. However, the size and the material that the electrodes are made out of is significant. The current density is inversely proportional to the size of the electrode. Occasionally during electrical therapy treatments, different sized electrodes may be used to either increase or decrease the current density among the motor points and to activate certain areas of the body. As we increase the current density, which means we decrease the area of the electrode, we increase the stimulus, which means there is a greater potential for an uncomfortable sensation under the smaller electrode. The size of the electrode and its placement determine the number of motor units that are stimulated. A small electrode placed over a single muscle will stimulate only that muscle, whereas a large electrode can stimulate a number of muscles. The size of the electrode also has a bearing on the current density under the electrode. The smaller the electrode is, the greater the current density will be, as long as the current output is the same. The conductivity of the material of the electrode will affect the amount of current flow. Carbon or silicone impregnated rubber electrodes seem to have better conductivity than do metal sponge electrodes, but their useful life is limited. The carbon or silicone will leach out with use, thus reducing the electrode's conductivity. Electrode placements can have an effect on the treatment of patients. A monopolar electrode placement occurs when one small active electrode is used with a larger dispersive pad. An active electrode is a smaller electrode under which the current density is great enough to elicit the desired response. A dispersive electrode is a larger electrode under which the current density is not great enough to elicit the desired response. An electrode is dispersive when it is much larger than the electrode or electrodes from the opposite terminal. It is used to complete the circuit and usually is applied to a location remote to the area being treated. A bipolar electrode placement occurs when there are two equal sized active electrodes. A quadpolar electrode placement occurs when there are four equal sized active electrodes. With a monopolar electrode placement, there is a small active pad that is placed over the target tissue. Sometimes this active pad is bifurcated, which means the lead gets split into two even smaller electrodes to surround an area. A large dispersive pad is used to complete the circuit and is usually placed away from the target area. Often a patient does not perceive current from under the dispersive site. The most common current type would be a monophasic current. Remember monophasic current is a pulse with only one phase. The current flows in only one direction. Bipolar pad placement is another option. A bipolar pad placement occurs when you have two active pads that are equal size. Remember, we are not talking about bipolar being a psychological condition. Rather, this is an electrode placement setup that can be modified for our patients. This is a commonly used method in TENS, or transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. This can be utilized with either a monophasic or a biphasic current. The patient should report equal stimulation under each electrode placement. The typical protocol is to sandwich the painful area or treatment area so that the pads aren't directly on top of the target area. Rather, if you drew a straight line from one pad to another, it would run directly through the target area. A quadpolar electrode setup requires that there are two sets of electrodes that result in four equally active electrodes. This setup is commonly used with interferential current, or IFC. Interferential current is one of the most commonly used electrical stimulation techniques in therapeutic clinics. With a quadpolar setup, it results in a three-dimensional configuration of the current. Interferential current is unique as the two currents actually affect each other and the resulting interfered current results in the treatment of the tissue. In this picture, we can see a quadpolar setup. We see that there are two leads, an A lead and a B lead, and they crisscross over the patient's knee. The resulting interfered current from the two sides is what patients feel is interferential current. It's a really comfortable current and most patients respond very well. If a clinician or a therapist is attempting to target certain tissues, they may want to identify either motor points or trigger points. Motor points are specific points in the body where motor nerves and blood vessels enter the muscle mass. 
When motor points are stimulated, it will result in a muscle twitch. Please consult with Appendix C within the Starkey text to locate common motor points in the human body. Trigger points, on the other hand, are pathological, localized areas that are hypersensitive to stimulation. When trigger points are stimulated, it will result in radiating or referred pain. Please consult with Appendix A within the Starkey text to locate common trigger points within the human body. There is also additional information in Box 12-3 on page 226 within the Starkey text regarding both motor points and trigger points. If a clinician is trying to locate stimulation points, either as motor points or trigger points, it is important that the clinician has a solid understanding of the musculature and underlying anatomy in which they are attempting to treat. It is imperative that a clinician be able to identify a muscle origin, insertion, and fiber direction in order to properly place an electrode. The electrodes must be placed along the direction of the muscle fiber. Do not place the electrodes perpendicular to the muscle fiber as it will have no effect on the muscular point you are attempting to stimulate. On occasion, a clinician may need to try out electrode placements and then relocate electrodes based on trial and error. In this picture, we can see that this is a quadricep muscle. We would want to place the electrodes parallel to the muscle fibers, meaning running in the same direction. We would not want to place them perpendicular as it would be very difficult to treat this individual muscle. Rather, we'd be getting generalized treatment and it wouldn't be targeted to just the quadriceps. A clinician will also have to determine the electrode proximity by determining how deep your target treatment area is. With the electrodes closer together, this is a relatively shallow treatment as there are few parallel paths for the electrical current to occur. By placing the pads further apart, the number of parallel paths increases, which should in theory result in a deeper treatment. The patient will tell you that the focus of the treatment stimulation becomes less defined the further away the electrodes are placed. For some clinicians, spreading the electrodes further apart causes concern, especially when electrodes crisscross the spine. Some clinicians refuse to cross the spine with electricity for the fear of stimulating the spinal nerves with a deeper treatment area. Of course, this is just a theory. In all reality, electricity is going to travel along the path of least resistance. While this picture has a demonstration of a fairly deep penetration of electrical energy within the quadricep muscle, that isn't actually the way the body works. To date, there are no documented cases of any spinal damage, injury, or even stimulation with the application of superficial electrode placements around the spine. The simple fact is that electricity will follow the path of least resistance, which is going to be at a superficial level. When we consider the depth of the spinal nerves, as well as the protective surrounding soft tissue, the relative risk of having the spine be affected by electricity is relatively low. However, it is completely up to a clinician to determine if this is a treatment they are comfortable providing. There are four primary levels of stimulation with the use of electrical therapy. Treatments can occur at a subsensory level with examples such as MENS or microcurrent. A microcurrent electrical neuromuscular stimulator or a MENS is a device that is used to send a weak electrical signal to the body. Such devices apply extremely small, less than one microamper, electrical currents to the nerves using electrodes placed on the skin. The patient cannot feel the treatment and there are no nerves that are activated. Treatment can also occur at a sensory level with an example such as TENS or transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. Sensory level stimulation occurs as a result of stimulation of the sensory nerves, usually the A beta fibers. Treatment may also occur at a motor level with an example of Russian current. Motor level stimulation occurs with the activation of the motor nerves and will result in a visible muscle contraction. Treatment can also occur at a noxious level. However, this isn't nearly as common of a treatment due to the extreme discomfort. This treatment results in a brief, intense, acupuncture-like transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. Noxious level stimulation occurs with the activation of the nociceptors, or the A delta, or C fibers, also our pain receptors. Please find quiz 7 over chapter 12. You will have 10 minutes to complete the quiz and it will be worth 10 points.